let's talk a little bit about growing up. Uh -huh. You grew up in Pittsburgh. Yep. Your father ran an auto upholstery. We didn't run it. He worked so, there. He worked there. Okay. Yeah. So what was that like, Mark? And, and how did that inspire you? I mean, my dad busted his ass. I mean, he worked six six days a week, um, left at 7, at 7, 7.30 in the morning, got back at 6 or 7 o'clock, um, lost his eye in an accident doing upholstery. He had a staple break when he was putting um, um, some covering on a car seat. Um, you know, it was, it was a, a middle-class upbringing. My mom did odd jobs. You know, they, they just wanted something better. I mean, my grandparents came over from Russia and, you know, my dad was the first generation. My uncles were the first generation Americans, like my mom too. And, you know, like every child of immigrants, they wanted better for their kids. You know, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people grow up that way, uh -huh. right? But not many people end up like you. So what do you think that's the result of? I think, you know, everybody's got something that they're good at. And the hard part is just finding it. And I found out early that I was a good salesperson, that I really liked business. You know, like I like sports. I mean, I read everything I possibly could, played sports as much as I could, just wasn't as good as I wanted to be. And, and business was the same way. I mean, as long as I could remember, I was buying and selling baseball cards, garbage bags, whatever I could find, stamps um, to collectors. But I was also reading everything I possibly could about business. And, you know, I was that unusual kid that, I'd rather read about Ted Turner than go to the movies. And, and so I think that created a foundation. And my parents didn't always, my dad used to always say, I don't understand what you're doing, <laughs> but I'm glad you're doing it. And, and so I had my ups and downs along the way, of course. But um, I just think that I just, I just put in the time and was fortunate enough to really get excited about business. And that paid off benefits over the long haul. I mean, you almost have to have that drive. Like, in other words, you can't fake it. You can't, no. like, pretend that you want to read about Ted Turner and, okay, I'll skip one movie. Well, it'll, it has I to mean, be you in can, your, your soul. Yeah, I mean, you can fake it, too. You make it in a lot of areas, yeah. particularly if you're working for somebody else. But at the end of the day, um, if you're going to be great at something, you've got to make the effort to be great at something, um, whether it's sports, whether it's physics, math, science, business, whatever it may be. You know, it's not just a natural skill. You've got, you've got to, to learn, and particularly if you're in the technology industry, because it changes every day. You know, when I got started, and, and you know, after I got, I, I got a, was a bartender when I first came to Dallas, got into the PC industry, got fired, started my own company. But there, I learned early on that there was always something new, and most people didn't put in the time to learn it. It's like now with artificial intelligence. Lots of people talk about artificial intelligence. Lots of people talk about machine learning and neural networks. Not a lot of people are putting in the time to take classes or do the tutorials or to, to learn how to apply it to business. And that's what it takes. And, and you know, that's just something I've always enjoyed. So I, I've been fortunate at that. Now, wait a minute. Are you doing that with AI yeah, right absolutely. now? Yeah, absolutely. What are you, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I've, I mean, I've been on Amazon doing the machine learning tutorials. Right now, I'm going through, um, I've taken Python online classes. Really? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you go in my bathroom, there's a machine learning for dummies book. Um, I just started uh, JavaScript neural networks. Um, there's a little tutorial where they've got most of the library, brain.js and all the libraries. And it's not, if you have a background in programming, it's not hard, but I'm not trying to be great at that, but I want to understand it. So I understand all the, you know, so I, the nuanced elements of it and how it works so that I have an advantage. But where would that take you? Like with your businesses here or the Mavericks or you know, Oh, everywhere. Know? It takes me everywhere, uh -huh. right? I mean, there's nothing that AI won't impact. As big as the, so been, having been around a while, I saw the impact of PCs. Then I saw the impact of local area networks. Then I saw the impact of wide area networks. Then I saw the impact of the internet. Then I saw the impact of mobile. Then I saw the impact of wireless. You know, now I'm seeing the impact of, of artificial intelligence and it dwarfs any of those things. And, if I don't understand how to apply it to my businesses. I mean, I remember selling PCs and software and walking in saying, you don't need to use that pen and paper on, on, a, you know, on a notepad or a ledger pad. Now we're going to give you a spreadsheet. And by the way, here's a, here's a spreadsheet that costs $495. And I had to pay to go get trained on how to sell it, which is crazy now when you think about it. But then we said, OK, now you can play what if. Then we said, you can connect these PCs. Unless I understood the technology, how was I going to explain it? How was I going to understand it? Unless I understand it now, how am I going to invest in it? 
You right. know, then I got to go trust somebody who says, oh, yeah, I know AI, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. And it's really easy just to have, just to, okay, say, so you figure it out. That's just not my style. So you're building a base of knowledge, and then you think that at some point it's going to pay dividends in terms of... It already of, has. Right? I mean, if, they, if you truly believe AI is going to change everything, how are you going to understand what people are doing to change everything unless you at least have a, a foundational understanding of it? Now, I'm not going to build a million-layer neural network and try to change the world. I'm not going to show you... I'm not going to write a research paper and saying, here's how why the lottery ticket approach works and you can build smaller neural networks with less data um, and be more you know, um, resource efficient. But I can read that stuff and understand that when somebody says, okay, we're building this project and we need this size data set or this size data set, or we need this amount of resources, I can ask questions and understand the answers. So you grew up in Pittsburgh, went to the University of Indiana for a while, then you said you came here. How have you adopted this city? Why did this become your home, Dallas? Well, I mean, when I went to IU, I had a bunch of friends that graduated and came down here, and they're like, you got to get your ass down here. The weather's great, the women are beautiful, the economy's good. I said, wait, back up. <laughs> <laughs> and right. I came down, um, lived six guys in a three-bedroom apartment until I found my way, and um, I've had a blast and loved it ever since. So how do you describe yourself, Mark? I mean, I said entrepreneur. Is that how you would describe yourself? What do you do for a living? I, I describe myself as a grinder. Um, you know, I just, like we talked about learning, that's a grind, but I love it, you know? And I just, I think I've just learned what I'm good at and learned to focus on those things and, and try to, you know, utilize those, those skills to now, you know, not just be an entrepreneur, but probably more often now invest in and help other entrepreneurs. Okay, so take us through your business interests right now. You have the basketball team, you right. do stuff for Shark I mean, Tank, you, you have stuff here. You can go to markcuban.com, I list them all right okay, there. Right. And so really, I mean, I've got Shark Tank and I've invested in 100 plus companies there. We've sold a bunch, so I think I've got 70 that are active now. Um, and you know, it follows the normal distribution, probably 10 are struggling, 50 are doing great, and 10 are, are, are doing incredible. Right. Um, but I think now, I've, I've really evolved some of my focus to trying to help disadvantaged entrepreneurs, people who have less op opportunity. I just invested with a woman, Arlen Hamilton, um, who we together created a little million dollar fund where she's going out and finding 10 businesses run by people of color or disadvantaged LGBTQ type communities and just opening doors because I think my, my experience applies to anybody. Right, any entrepreneur, no matter what you're trying to sell. And I also think that it's a great business opportunity simply because the, the markets that they want to sell to are underserved. There just aren't as many entrepreneurs, so there's more opportunity. And so I, I think it makes great business sense as well. But let's go through some of these other things. So starting with Shark Tank, uh -huh. I mean, what's Shark Tank like? Is it really a kick the way it looks like yeah. it is? I mean, it, it's great. We start shooting here probably in a couple of weeks, June 12th or 13th, I think it is. And the way it works literally is we show up on set in, in Sony Studios and I get there about 8.30 and put on, they put on a little bit of makeup. I throw on my suit, like Kevin, Mr. Wonderful, Mr. And Wonderful. Lori, they have to get there two hours earlier oh, because they need tons they need of makeup. Work? They need, oh, Kevin's you, got a lot more land. listening to that. Kevin's got a lot more land mass to cover and, there you and go. Lori's Lori. Uh -huh. um, but in any event, we start shooting at about 9.00. And they just bring in deal after deal after deal. We know nothing about them. They'll say, you know, this is, you know, Joe and Sally, and this is the name of their business, and they'll walk in and give our pitch. Now, on television, it might take 10 to 14 minutes. In real life, if it's a stupid deal, it might take 20 minutes mm -hmm. and then before we, we, we're all out. Right. And then if it's a, an intense deal, it could go 90 minutes, two hours. Mm -hmm. And then they have to edit it down. But it's our money. It's all real. We know nothing about them. If we decide to do a deal, then we have the opportunity to do due diligence after right. the fact, because sometimes they'll embellish, it's a polite way to put it. Yeah. You know, my widget cost a dollar to make and we sold a million of them, when in reality, the widget cost $10 and they've sold six. And that you know, happens sometimes? Yeah, it does happen more often than mm. you'd, you'd think. Mm. Um, the producers are spo supposed to um, ferret that stuff out, but yeah. not a lot, doesn't happen as much as we'd like. So yeah, we'll do due diligence right. and about 60% of my deals close. Right. Um, the other little thing is of the deals that present to us, and we'll see 
in any given season, 250 to 300 that are presented, probably 25% of people who pitch us that come in are taped and pitch to us don't even make it on air mm, for a, wow. a variety of reasons. Yeah. And, and let me ask you about your entertainment business, uh, the movies and 2929, Magnolia. Uh, What's that all about? Well, back in 2000, and 2000, I guess it was, after I'd sold Yahoo, right after I bought the Mavs, I started the world's first all high definition TV network. When everybody was saying high definition television is not going to happen, um, I created a network called HDNet and HDNet Movies, and there was very little content for it. I mean, literally, this is when high def televisions cost $15,000, and everybody said, who the hell is going to pay $15,000 for a TV? And I, w I went around telling everybody, no, you just wait. Those televisions are going to drop like a rock in terms of price, and everybody's going to want one that goes on their wall instead of this big, ugly hunks of analog TV. So I had that, but we didn't have content. And so we wanted to go out there and create content. And we also bought landmark um, theaters, which we have since sold. But we wanted that vertical environment where we could show it on television, put it online, offer DVDs, um, put, um, put it video on demand, and also offer in theaters. And so we created, um, we created 2929 Productions first, where we produce movies. What does that name mean, by the way? 2929 was because the address for AudioNet, the, the streaming company we created, yeah. was 2929 Elm Street. Ah, okay. So that's where that came from. Right. Um, and then, so we had movie production 2929. We had Landmark Theaters. We also bought Reicher Entertainment, which we've since sold, that owned Hogan's Heroes and some others so that we could put it on HDNet. HDNF Films, and then Landmark. And so the idea was to have it vertically mm -hmm, integrated. Right. So we were the first company to, um, to, put, create, to produce a movie, put it online, download, they basically offer a day and date release of it called Bubble. Um, and we, we've been doing Magnolia and um, 2929 Productions ever since. The others, um, yeah, Magnolia 2929, the others we've sold. What do all these businesses tell you about the economy right now? What do you think the outlook uh, is? Well, that's a good question. So some of my smaller Shark Tank companies that, are, that resell products are getting crushed by the tariffs. I mean, I've got one that may go out of business simply because tariffs at 10% were one thing. Tariffs at 25%, they just can't compete. Um, there's other companies that have bigger and better supply chains where they were more creative and we're within 5% of their prices, but now with the tariffs, it's, it's almost impossible and the uncertainty, it's made it very, very difficult. Um, but beyond that, I mean, business is, is going well in urban markets and it's a little bit tougher in smaller markets. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it pretty much mirrors what you see in the general economy. Right. 